Realm presents Control Alt Destroy, Episode 3. The drone hovered overhead. Miles Adisa took little note of it, not wanting it to acquire full facial recognition should he look up. His mother had taught him better than that. He was ten years old and she'd already had that talk with him. He waited for the drone to continue on its patrol before retrieving the panels from the shed. After lugging them up to the roof, he took only an hour to spread them across the rooftop of their house. His mother, Ella Adisa, wiped her forehead after she climbed onto the roof. Fresh from harvesting in the garden to ensure they'd have enough food for the next few days, she yanked off her gloves and then inspected his handiwork. Looking good, Em, she said. Thanks, he said. I should have the whole house done before sunset. Then we won't have to worry about brownouts. That's the hope. My sister wants to have the entire block off the grid by the end of the month. When will Aunt Etta come by to visit? Miles asked. I don't know, baby. She's off doing important work for important people. But she hasn't forgotten about us. Tandy, class failed archer. Level, two. HP, 49 out of 49. Status, normal. XP, 1,645. Next level, 3,000. It took a few minutes for Tandy's eyes to adjust to the darkened hallway. Lamplight fell from the sconces at the top of the stairs. With each step on the creaking wood, she had the uneasy sensation of exploring a dark corridor in a castle. She gripped and re-gripped her rustic bow for assurance until they reached their floor. The second floor of the Bell and Bones wasn't too high up in the inn, affording the team a hasty escape if the need arose. According to Ben, the ground floor presented more defensive issues, and with it, a greater worry of unwanted company lurking outside. Innkeeper Bell pursed her lips and grabbed a ring of keys. She unlocked the door and it opened with a melancholy groan. The small parlor was austere, with only a fireplace and a few chairs in it. A large oak table was tucked in the corner. I hope you enjoyed the accommodations. The innkeeper unshuttered the windows to allow in a faint breeze. The small round windows would be a tight squeeze and a pinch. A baby griffin flew by. Innkeeper Bell shambled back down the stairs. Ben scouted the room, stalking the periphery as if checking for traps or listening devices. The space would be a cozy fit for everyone, but it was better than the prospect of camping under the stars. Tandy had thought about allowing customizable housing for players in alternus perhaps including it as an option in a later edition. The room was more like a suite. The parlor opened into two adjoining bedrooms. Each room had two narrow beds. A chest sat at the foot of each bed with a fitting for a lock in case anyone had to store extra valuables. Everyone needed a moment to regroup in their own way. Dante didn't say a thing upon returning from whatever walkabout he was on, then contented to perch on the hearth. Tandy stood by the windows. She turned up the background music. A soft melody, full of lush strings with a bit of a mournful quality. Played like the theme music accompanying the halls of a lost legendary hero. Ben took the first room. Still brooding in silence, he looked like he was one stray comment away from punching something. Etta retreated to the other room like a woman who had to scratch five items from her to-do list before she was fit for human company. Tandy presumed the sleeping arrangements defaulted to pairing off according to gender. They were all on guard and on edge, as if suspecting the walls themselves had ears. No one spoke for the better part of an hour, each team member lost in their thoughts, agendas, and schemes as they considered their next move. And probably Tandy's role in that plan. It was only a matter of time before they came to the same conclusion. There was no way they were going to be able to complete a level 9 quest with Tandy in tow. Tandy knew that she was a drag on the rest of the group. She could easily imagine what they must be thinking. She wandered about like a baffled tourist. If they were now in a race, one with real-world consequences, they no longer had the luxury of leveling her up gradually. 
Tandy needed to be swapped out, and it was just a matter of figuring the logistics to make it happen. Sitting on the marble ledge that ringed the stone fireplace, Dante gestured frantically, his eyes distant. Whatever information spread across his heads-up display must have expanded, drifting out as quite the presentation. He swiped at the air as if swatting at a swarm of imaginary insects, toggling images as if juggling with one hand and brushing them all aside to start his gyrating calculations again. A soft click behind her signaled that Etta was re-entering the parlor. Whatever her thoughts, conclusions, or machinations, her face betrayed nothing. She simply joined Tandy in standing off to Dante's side, hypnotized by him as if he were the flames dancing in a fireplace. Do I even want to know what he's doing? Tandy asked. Planning, Etta said. He gets like that when he's plunging down into a statistical rabbit hole. Ugh. Don't tell me he's a min-maxer type. I should have remembered. I believe the word you're looking for is efficient, Dante said without so much as a head turn in their direction. We only have so many resources, so many skill sets. My job's to get the most out of my performance, Ben's spell damage, and us as a team. Let him do his thing. Embracing a mage's flair for dramatic entrances, Ben had crept up on them. His robes wrapped around him in such a way that they hid most of his body, even his hands and feet. Tandy jumped at the sound of his voice, but was glad for the conversation. How does that not take the joy out of playing? Getting the most out of our play is my joy, Dante said. But you lose sight of the experience of the game. Dante glared at her like she was an insect he didn't recognize. I'm here to beat the game. That's what I do, by any means necessary. Etta nodded with approval and we need to let him do it his way. Dante continued to stare at the air like a mathematician caught up in his equations when he froze. Mouth ajar as if in disbelief, he cocked his head to the side. Sweet Christmas. Nope, we're not doing that. Etta shook her head. What do you have? All right, everyone, get comfortable. Professor Dante's got today's lesson ready. Dante bounced on his heels while he waited for them to get situated and broke into pacing back and forth with the swagger of a dude particularly pleased with himself. I'm done going through the game docs about this so I can give you a mission brief for the Skull King's Crown quest. Dante passed his images over in a group share. The information filled the side of Tandy's and presumably everyone's heads up display. Quest, the Skull King's Crown, recommended level nine. Required achievements, none. Number of players, four. Location, Ravenshire. Number of bosses, unknown. Final boss, Skull King. This isn't a new classroom assignment, Ben said. We know all this. I don't get why you're so excited. I'm excited because we don't have to wait to get to level nine. We can do this now and beat everyone. The room went quiet. Even the music paused. Tandy pictured them being in an old Western saloon when a mysterious stranger walked in and all conversation plus the piano player stopped at the same time. What do you mean? Tandy enlarged her note to see if she'd missed anything. Here's a rough look at what we'd be facing. With a casual shrug, Dante shared a new image. Though a rough sketch, she recognized the Skull King's tower when she saw it, its dreary moat, its tall walls almost crystalline. Spires and cathedral-like structures that spread out from the main imposing edifice. Most of it almost burrowed into the side of a looming mountain with a distinctly skull-shaped peak. Why does this look familiar? Etta asked. Because the designers cop from Castle of the Lich King and Castle Ravenloft. It's like generic Scary Castle 101. Etta tweaked the air as if adjusting its volume. Though more likely, she was examining the sketch from different angles and close-ups. How do you know all this? Tanny gave me the idea. All eyes fell on her as Dante continued. She insinuated that NPCs often have information buried in their dialogue trees if you drill down deep enough. I don't know what you all do in your alone time, but I like to wander around. By wander, you mean hang out in the bar? Ben asked. Dante spread his arms as if to bow. A magician never reveals his secrets. 
Let's just say that after I bought a few rounds, all I had to do was wait for NPCs to spill all kinds of information. You know, the lone survivors of a party who failed spectacularly, there to warn off others. Half of what they say is the stuff of campfire stories, but there are a few nuggets. But what good does it do us? You might as well be showing us the Lord of the Rings movie poster, Etta said. Okay, go with me on this. On a typical quest that ends in a castle raid, there's a sort of assumed strategy. Find the staff of unobtainium or whatever and begin by teleporting to the front gate. The party goes through a series of escalating bosses until they get to the big boss and their goal, in this case, the Skull King's crown. But there are a few design flaws to this one. First, there is no attunement process. I don't know, Ben started. Dante waved him off. There are no prequests required, no keys to collect, no rings to gather. We can enter the castle at will as soon as we get there. The location's not even secret, like it's daring us to go there. The big glowing recommended level nine might dampen the rush, Ben said. Whatever. There'll be some runes or some other protective stuff inside, I'm sure, but there are no special requirements to enter. This all screams trap. Pure bait for you obsessive gamer drones. Can you do me a favor? Dante asked. What's that? Can you say, damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a crown thief. Dante took a step backward and crossed his arms. Depends, Ben said. Can you let me know what my shoe tastes like once I plant it that deep into your ass? All right, that's enough. Etta turned back to Dante. Take us through your idea. Here's my best guess. The raid is supposed to have two phases, the lower level and the upper level. The way the NPCs describe them, there might be portals between each section. So you don't have to explore every inch of the place, only the sections you want. Like I said, I'm working off of rumors and guesses, so this won't be 100%. Now, the usual approach would be to have the party lead with their fighters and meet shields supported by clerics and healers, followed lastly by range attackers, like a mage. Dante cleared the close-up of the castle entrance and started placing symbols for each of them in formation. He drew arrows flying back and forth, monsters charging and explosions. It's a loud and messy approach, but if you're at the recommended level, it gets the job done. I propose something a bit more subtle. Clearing the map, Dante focused on a section of the image near the top. At the base of the skull-shaped peak was what looked to be an earthen bridge. It ran just above the top of the rear of the castle. What if we could climb down from the overlook above the castle and enter through the windows installed in what I'm gonna call the tomb room? Let's say we make our approach just before evening. Early twilight presents a window of opportunity since it would keep many tomb guardian types sluggish, assuming they stirred at all. Led by our sneak specialist, say, a veiled archer, we could get in, go up the additional floor, grab the crown, and get out through the same window, and the plan bypasses all the buses. What do you think? Ben? Etta asked. Ben ran his hand from one of the folds in his robe through his beard. It actually has merit. See, you didn't even... Wait, what? Dante froze his reflexive protest. Ben shared highlighted portions of the map for everyone's benefit. We'd have an element of surprise. I like the unconventional approach aspect to it, but there's still a lot of unknowns. Terrain, escape routes. Etta turned to Tandy. What do you think? I don't know. Tandy stared back and forth between the recommended level 9 warnings and her hit points. Maybe we could wait a little while? Yeah, 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 Dante said. We'd have to do some prep work, but... Who dares wins? Ben turned to her. Do you have a better plan? Tandy's mouth opened as if to comment, but hitched without sound when she felt the weight of their scrutiny. Searching their faces for an ally against the united strong personalities of Ben and Dante, she wilted. No, this could work. Leveling her assessing gaze at Tandy, Etta stepped in. All we have is the released backstory notes that are part of the announcement. We need more intel. I say we wait. Let's investigate in Night's Hold, grab another mission to maybe level up Tandy a little, perhaps learn to gel more as a team, and follow Dante's lead to gather additional information from NPCs. Then we could try his plan. 
With a wave, she cut Dante off before he started. I get we're in a race, but we have to be prepared as well as ready. Ben's and Dante's twin glares at Tandy seemed to accuse her of being the reason they didn't move forward with their idea. She began to think of ways she could engineer getting herself replaced. Two, Etta, Class Divine Seeker, Level 5. HP 73 out of 73, mana 30 out of 30, status normal, XP 12,385, next level 15,000. All her life, Edda Adisa had fought against the opinions of people who thought she didn't deserve to be at the table, much less head it. When she was a teenager, she had actually been a bit of a gamer. Going by the name Precious when she competed, she gave that life up when she received a full ride to Spelman University, and studying consumed her life. Gaming became a distant image in her rearview mirror as she began her career and rose through the ranks of the State Department. Still, she could appreciate the imagination and heart that went into creating Alternus. The rendering of its virtual reality was like nothing she'd ever experienced. The gentle rolling hillside, the gigantic butterflies, the occasional moo cows. Moo cows. Like oversized versions of the actual animals as drawn by children. Though she'd never admit it to Dante, Etta loved every bit of the throwback cheesiness of this place. It was like wandering in a tribute to all of the games she'd loved playing. They followed a less traveled road that ran along the edge of town. Look at all the teams playing right now. Tandy studied the landscape following the skirmishes and the grinding like a lost sightseer. That girl could wear a body out, all wide-eyed and acting brand new. With the current quest announcement, it's like everyone's come to the yard. Yeah, I expected everyone to be farming or doing side quests to level up. Dante was another one who didn't fool anyone. All chest-puffed bravado, but still with the smell of his mother's milk on his breath grumbling and pretty much pouting from not getting his way. He was good, though. Not as good as he put on, but he was solid. And more important, he had potential he probably didn't even realize. Since that's the play every other team is making, we should do something else, I'm just saying. Or it's like they understand they need to be at their best before tackling a level 9 quest, Edda said. Have you seen the leaderboard? Ben asked. If Etta played Big Mama to the group, Ben had the gravitas she depended on to drive home a wait-till-your-daddy-gets-here threat. I'm stunned with how well certain teams are doing. I know what you mean, Etta said. Our advance reports had different teams assessed as top ten contenders. Obviously, some countries must have resources and training we didn't know about. Or a greater pool of gamers to draw on. Dante wandered to the edge of the path and stopped cold. Oh. Fuck. What? Etta joined him on the side of the path. Dante pointed to the valley. The Koreans just showed up. Four players scrambled into a line near the forest's opening. They had the appearance of twin archers, a mage, and a sword-wielding assassin. Their outfits were white, and each of them wore a pair of sunglasses. Charging right toward the Korean players, creatures poured down the other side of the valley. What the hell are those things? They're like half people, half pigs, Edda said. They look like children of Kamapua'a, a demigod from ancient Hawaiian mythology, Candy said. Alternus must draw on myths from all around the world. Makes sense considering the players, no one would have a cultural advantage that way, Edda said. Well, whatever they are, the Koreans are going to make short work of them, Dante said. The swarm of mini Kamapua'a numbered at least a couple dozen. The Koreans responded like a well-choreographed ballet troupe. The two archers ran back and forth, bounding from tree to ground only to disappear back into the copse of trees. Their arrow shots were nearly predictive, as they targeted where the creatures would be when the arrows struck. Their gymnastic movements didn't allow a fixed target for the man-pigs to scramble after. The Korean mage launched a volley of magic missiles. 
They struck their targets and were followed up by the explosive concussion of flames. Probably a fireball augmented by explosive runes, a move only an adept could pull off. The blast scattered the mini Kamapua'a, who accidentally regrouped by heading through the same opening in the grove of trees not guarded by the arrow-wielding hunters. The players moved as if with one mind, an acrobatic display of martial precision. It's a trap, Ben said with a calm resolve. The creatures are being funneled and they don't even realize it. Like the Battle of Thermopylae. Overwhelming forces don't matter if they're shunted into manageable portions. Dante stared at him blankly. Sink the movie 300, Ben said. Oh, that I get. True to Ben's assessment, a long figure blocked the creature's near single file charge. A blade now in each hand, the rogues spun around in a surprise attack. Some mini Kamapua'a he stepped past only to backstab. When he left a sword buried in one creature, he produced a dagger with a flick of his wrist and then hurled the weapon. The enchanted blade returned to his hand like a boomerang, no matter how much flesh it had ripped into. Just when the creatures considered bolting in every direction, two of the other Korean players descended upon them from either side, their mage blocking their rear escape route. The slaughter was over in moments. When they finished, the Koreans regathered. Perfectly aware of the audience they'd drawn, the assassin took point, buttressed by the unison of the troop. Their heads swiveled with robot-like isolations, their bodies not moving. Eventually, the troop fell into a line of synchronized pelvic thrusts before finishing a Michael Jackson-inspired dance routine. Not waiting for the applause they knew was due, the Koreans moonwalked out of the clearing. What the entire hell did we just see? Ben asked. The Koreans. Dante didn't bother to hide the awe in his voice. Looks like we weren't their only audience. Ben nodded past Edda's shoulder. His eyes narrowed, and all his chill left him. The Borises are heading our way. The Russian delegation approached. Let's not refer to them that way. If the name sticks, someone will end up using it in front of them, and my job becomes ten times harder, Edda said. With their blunt, deliberate steps, the two leading the parade made a show of simply walking. Though dressed as a paladin and a barbarian of some sort, their posture had a military bearing. Their chests demanded that whatever shirt covered them be ripped off. They bore similar slightly bulbous noses, dark brows, and lashes, like they'd been ordered from the same catalog. At the rear was a mage, a serious-faced woman who Edda was willing to bet rarely smiled without good reason, like the gesture was a waste of effort. Her delicate porcelain skin was made more pale by her blood-red robes. At the heart of the group was Ruslana Timofeyeva, a diplomat and politician and former representative to the United Nations. She was in line to be the next foreign minister of Russia. An avid footballer who'd almost gone pro, she was still a huge Spartak fan. Her avatar resembled an idealization of her as a player instead of the graying, bespectacled woman who Etta had come to know outside of Alternus. Her long black hair swept back and framed a strong, angular face. The woman's avatar was considerably taller, too. Not to be looked down upon by anyone, man or woman. As they neared, Etta switched her hair to maroon bantu knots. Ben flanked her. The pair strode ahead, leaving Tandy and Dante off to the side, rather confused. Ruslana lined up across from Etta, her three team members fanning out behind her. Everyone tensed, on guard and ready for anything to jump off. With a flourish, a cigarette appeared in Ruslana's hand. How are you, Ruslana? Etta asked with a tone so calculating in its syrupy delivery that her teeth almost ached. Annoyed by this entire experiment. RPGs to solve problems? Bah. This might be a fine way for Americans to compete for resources, but we put away our childish things. Ruslana had only the barest trace of an accent, unless angry or drunk, both states Etta had dealt with before. 
A sinister sort of blowhard, Ruslana didn't beat around the bush and had little tolerance for small talk. But she loved to nest agendas inside of convoluted deceptions. Why, yes, I'm fine. My family is doing well. Etta made a show of finishing the obligatory polite chit-chat before her own subtle shift. The way I hear it, your team has enjoyed playing all kinds of games. It's just us here, Ruslana began. No cameras, no audience, no need for speech making. It's just us, like old friends. Is that what we are now? Etta asked. Don't be that way. Surely the length of our professional acquaintance allows for some familiarity. Ruslana waved her arms in small, conciliatory circles. Tandy trailed Dante as he inched forward to hear better. He caught the eye of the Russian mage and something familiar passed between them. Yes, it does. These diplomatic exchanges help keep the peace. Like the former military-to-military -military exchange programs, BA. BA? Etta asked. Before Alternus. The corners of Ruslana's lips turned up slightly as she brought her cigarette to them. Uh-huh. Do you remember how we old friends used to solve our problems? Like when one friend decided to test powerful toys near their other friend's borders? Ruslana took a long, slow drag from her cigarette. Ah, uh, yes. Those were the days. Sometimes we had so many toys we lost track of one or two on occasion. We were well within our rights. And in international waters, I might add. Both teams were on the clock and felt the pressure of the stakes, but neither could afford to show it. That would seem too much like weakness, desperation. Etta began to saunter, walking a circuitous path around Ben, past Dante and Tandy, briefly inspecting the Alpha Paladin and Barbarian, and sidled up to the other side of her Russian counterpart. Negotiations, which even casual conversations degenerated into, were always one part performance, one part teeth bearing. Etta started with a lower voice. I have a little nephew. My sister's son. She had me babysit for him all the time, B.A. Any time I tried to tell him where he could and couldn't go, he would go tap dance as close to the line as possible. Just to test me. It only took one time touching the line for him to figure out that I am not one to be tested. Ruslana remained unmoved. She puffed on her cigarette, a languid gesture, before crushing the butt beneath her shoe. That reminds me. I have a little niece, my brother's daughter. She's a complete, how do you say, <laughs> pain in the ass. Leaves her toys everywhere, expects the rest of her siblings to play around them, and when she's told otherwise, throws fits just to provoke us. Push our buttons, as it were. She forgets that I, too, am not one to be tested. I can push buttons, too. Sometimes I'd invite other folks, friends she wasn't as fond of, over to the house to remind her to be careful of her toys and where she plays because if she wasn't careful, she could quickly find her toys stepped on and broken with herself surrounded by resentful friends. It was exactly these sorts of dealings that made the Russians get under her skin in their own special way. Etta never lost sight of Ruslana, the woman who'd graduated high school with a silver medal and had a love of science, especially physics, who was given early entry into the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, but entered Moscow State Institute of International Relations instead, who spoke seven languages. Eight, if Etta counted the belligerent brand of diplomacy Ruslana was so fluent in. Etta paused and took a breath to recenter herself. We have a lot in common, you and I. Etta raised her hands as if tamping down flames. The overture caught Ruslana off guard. Etta pressed her advantage. We fight for the same things. How so? Ruslana's voice held a note of skeptical caution. Walk with me. Etta took Ruslana's arm. She gave the slightest shake of her head to Ben and the others to allow her a little space. You know what I've always admired about the Russians? You're not soft. You know what it's like to grow up in hard places and do without. 
You know how to adapt what little you have into a life to call your own. Times were hard all over, but where I'm from, you couldn't use words like brownouts because it implied that we ever had power. Food desert? There is no climate that could describe our lack of food access. Our sky, day or night, was filled with policing drones. It was what became of the American dream. But my family realized we had a resource they hadn't denied us. One another. Nearly a dozen families changed their names to signify a commitment to our community. My family became the Adesas. We survived by organizing. We don't bother with currency, only one another. We pooled our power rations. We created our own infrastructure under the noses of those who'd rather pretend we didn't exist. We developed community gardens so we could eat, started and frequented our own businesses for work. We carved out our place and won't be moved. This is why I don't understand how you, of all people, could represent the West, Ruslana said. I'm in a position to better fight for my people as you are for yours. We are a simple people. We do not respond well to outsiders telling us how to live. We will do whatever it takes to win. Ruslana produced another cigarette. Do you perhaps have any additional relative to bring up? I think I've told you enough about my family for one day. Ruslana chuckled. I always liked you. Eta Adisa. But time is not on our side, and we are not here to covert with our enemies. How about we simply kick your ass in the next quest? His patience for diplomacy at its end. Ben stepped nearer in an aggressive manner. Ruslana's people watched him. The diplomat held them in check with a flick of her cigarette. We look forward to you trying. Ruslana turned back to Etta. We live in fraught times. I'd hate for anyone to be hurt due to unfortunate misunderstandings. Das Vidanya. Das Vidanya. Etta bowed slightly. Tovarish. Out of respect, Ruslana returned the bow and the Russians withdrew. I really can't stand her, Ben said. I can tell, but don't get it twisted. She's a tough and sophisticated negotiator. Her version of the good old boy routine is strictly for show. She plays on the stereotypes of Russians to get people to underestimate her. Russians enjoy chess for a reason. They love thinking five, six steps ahead. In chess, you play the player. An egotist like Ruslana is vulnerable to flattery. She likes when I play into her idea of their superiority. Etta studied the Russians as if waiting for Ruslana to glance back. When she didn't, Etta spit toward the side. Do you know what she's called behind her back? The Rusalka. Even by her own people. What's that mean? Ben asked. It's a dark figure in their folklore. Think of them as a type of sinister mermaid. In areas where crops grew well and life is going well, the stories people spin about the Rusalka paint them as charming and playful. But in harsher places, when times are hard, the Rusalka are wild, dangerous. Crawling from the water at night, climbing trees and singing their enticing songs to draw people out and ambush them, particularly men, and drag them into watery graves. Ben turned to Dante with a grin. Your takeaway lesson should be always be on guard around the Russians. We like to test their defenses as much as they do ours. I expect it to be no different here, Etta said. We all make moves and counter moves. That's the game, if you choose to play it that way. Ben arched a bushy eyebrow. Meaning? Meaning. I'm all in now. If only to wipe the smirk off Ruslana's face, Etta said. If Ben thinks it's an acceptable risk, we can try your plan, Dante. What do you need? Dante beamed with sudden delight. First, we have to gear up. Three. 
Tandy. Class, Veiled Archer. Level, 2. HP, 49 out of 49. Status, Normal. XP, 1,645. Next level, 3,000. Tandy didn't recall this many taverns in Knight's Holt. The Drunken Claw, the Filthy Hosen, the Toreador Inn, the Roasted Pig, the Princess Blossom, which stood atop a mushroom, one of her creations. Though not a drinker despite how many bars populated her world, Tandy really wanted to pound a shot, or 12. The entire alternate experience threatened to overwhelm her. Where are we heading? Ben reflexively took point as the group walked. The auction house. Let's see if we can afford any potions, especially healing potions. You can equip them to your action hotbar. Dante nipped at Ben's heels, taking one and a half steps for every one of the other man's. Thanks. I have done this before. What else? I'm not sure. I kind of wanted to browse, see if there were any mission-specific items like scrolls with spells to have locked and loaded. I have to pick up some supplies anyway. Extra rope, grappling hook, that sort of thing. Look, soldier boy, just because you can repel and stuff in real life doesn't mean you can do it in here. You're a mage now, not a marine or whatever. Air Force. I said whatever, Dante shrugged. In here, you need to think like a mage. So more like a levitation spell to lower us down? Maybe a portal spell of some sort in case of an emergency evac or something. Dante lit up. Yeah, like that. Ben warmed to the idea. Can you go over my specs? I want to set my damage spells for maximum dispersal. But I don't know how much mana I'll burn with each spell. I waited so long to hear those words. Dante wiped an imaginary tear from his face. They grow up so fast. Not wanting to intrude on their budding bromance, Tandy wandered off. Dante's proclamation about one of Ben's spells being straight OP echoed after her. There was a slope just behind the bell and bones that led down to a lake. She didn't have a lot of time before they attempted their run at the Skull King's castle. Filled with nervous energy and a drowning terror, she hoped to kill time and burn off some of her anxiety with any sort of mindless grind to level up. She'd even do a cloth grind to build her reputation with the sewing guild. A sheep grazed nearby. Tandy strolled over to it. Instinctively, she thought to draw down her command menu to create a quick key for her forward slash love emote. But she no longer had to do any of that. All she had to do was pet them. Plus one XP popped up with each new sheep she petted. She paced the hillside, loving the creatures. It was meant to be an introductory exploration achievement, but it still counted toward level experience. She was little used to the team other than as a guide and had so much to catch up on. So you're out here petting sheep now. Etta's voice from behind startled her. It's a thing. I guess everyone has their own way of prepping for a mission. Etta plopped down in the grass. I don't need much by way of cuddles, but hey, you do you. Ha, <laughs> Tandy said, not knowing how else to respond. She circled once, twice, and as if caught in Etta's gravitational pull, sat down next to her. I get it. You feel some sort of way about how things have gone down. Etta glared at the sheep that strayed too close. You don't have to just take their crap, you know. Dante tends to cut the fool. Ben's mostly bluster. It's their plan. It seems smart to just go with it. But you have reservations? Etta cocked her head quizzically. I guess. It's all moving too fast. I don't think it's thought through. More like a notion Dante has fixated on and is determined to make work. And frankly, I don't know if we're ready. You mean if you're ready? Etta gently bumped into her to help draw her out. And so, this petting protocol. <sighs> Something like that, Dandy smiled. Etta's words were said without teeth or venom and even had an encouraging warmth to them. Look, if you have concerns, I need to hear them. The only way for me to make informed decisions is to hear all the voices on my team. I said my piece, Tandy said, half mumbling. She failed to meet Etta's eyes. Let me put it another way. Those voices 
need to make sure they're heard. You may get shouted down, outvoted, or overruled, but make sure your opinions get noted. That's all I'm saying. Okay? Okay. Tandy ran her hands through the grass, the moment still too charged to risk making eye contact. Do you get a chance to talk much with your family? Why do you ask? The stuff you told the Russians. Like I'm gonna give them my real story, Edda said. Wow. Well, it fooled me too, Tandy said. It felt real like it came from a true place. That's my job in a nutshell. To lie convincingly to fulfill my agenda. Edda studied Tandy's face and sighed. Not as much as I'd like to, I suppose. My family, I mean. So what do you do? Send money back? Tandy guessed. My heart is still there. They fill my thoughts and fuel my work. Everything I do is for them. So far, Tandy had shied away from Etta, afraid of doing or saying the wrong thing in front of her. But this was something else. Like Etta was about more. Like she had a purpose, a mission for her life. Something other than counting down the minutes of her day at a dead-end job or retreating home to tinker on a game rather than carve out a real life. Do you even have a sister? Tandy asked. Asked someone who must have been an only child and always wondered what having a sibling was like. Edda studied Tandy's face for confirmation, which came as a slight blush. Yes. As a matter of fact, I do, and a nephew. He's neuroatypical. I see a lot of him in Dante. My sister is nine years younger than I am, closer to your age than mine. She always went her own way, as my mom said, which was her code for my sister simply drifting through life. It took her a long time to find her thing. Her thing? That thing that sparked her. But you know what I wish I'd thought to tell her? that it was okay for her to take a while to find it. You get there when you get there. Until then, just enjoy being you and those around you. Sound about right. Sounds about right. Tandy couldn't help but feel like Etta had been probing her to figure her out, in a good way. And she appreciated it. Mahalo. Mahalo. Etta said. Tandy arched an eyebrow. What? We watched Lilo and Stitch in our neighborhood. Ohana means family and all that. Now, did you learn anything more about the castle? Any hints about what we may face inside? There are supposed to be a series of bosses. Based on the jerks who broke up with me in the worst ways, Tandy thought. One actually ghosted me after a year and a half of dating. No calls, texts, nothing. Another sent his mom to break up with me, which is only marginally worse than the one who sent his other girlfriend to do the deed. This one guy put me off for a couple of days by claiming to have a family thing, but he only wanted to give his breakup postcard time to arrive. Breakup postcard. But the guy I based the Skull King on was the worst. Tandy. Tandy. Edda snapped her fingers in front of her face. You drifted off. You were saying something about the bosses? The Skull King spreads the scourge. It's a disease known to rot the flesh off the living and reanimate the dead under his control. Any female paladin who has fallen to his infection guards the tombs of his lair as a death knight. Are you all right, Tandy? You look peaked. It was a really bad breakup, Tandy thought. I just need some water or something. Anyway, my best guess, if he plays true to form, is that the Skull King sits at the top of his citadel but doesn't make an appearance until you get to the heart of his sanctum. We're bypassing his sanctum as much as possible. The planned route puts us behind his throne room. We could get in and out before he knows we're there. These must be some informative sheep. Etta glanced sideways at her. Before Tandy could respond, an alert slowly scrolled across her view. Error zero. Canada disqualified.
4. Dante, Class, Bladed Guardian, Level, 6, HP, 100 out of 100, Status, Normal, XP, 16,975, Next Level, 21,000. At the sight of the alert, Dante elbowed Ben and took off toward where he had last spied Etta and Tandy. They'd bought everything they could afford, well, bartered in Dante's case, as he traded some of the items he'd picked up in the side quest he'd made before Tandy's arrival. He trotted over to Etta and was barely out of earshot of Anon NPCs before he blurted, What the hell is Error Zero? It means they were caught cheating. Etta waved off all the follow-up questions forming on all their lips. I have no idea what that means other than Canada is out. That's gotta hurt. Depending on how long they're out, they're gonna lose standing, Ben said. At the very least, it may even cost some of their players a few levels, Dante said. I'm not sure what all it could mean. If I receive any clarification, I'll let you know. Etta nodded toward the castle. Now if we're ready... We head to Ravenshire. The woods outside of Knight's Holt took on a sinister aspect. The closer to the mountains they marched, the more the landscape became barren and rocky. The trees grew like grave markers, their dark limbs outstretched without leaves. Silent ravens watched from the branches. Three, seven, nine to a tree, waiting as if the earth itself had been poisoned, and they were all that remained to commemorate it. We're being watched, Ben said. All those birds and not a sound are starting to creep me out, Dante said. No, he means the other teams are spying on us, trying to guess what we're up to, Etta said. Taking notes on how we fail? Tandy hoped her expression didn't betray her thoughts. What are the chances this will work? Hold on. I'll give you a quick number crunch. His eyes focused. Dante began swiping at the air again before pausing and tapping his chin thoughtfully. 32.3 repeating percent of survival. Is he joking? Tell me he's joking, Tandy said. He's gone full Leroy Jenkins on us, Etta said. They're both joking, I think, Ben said. Given the opportunity of moving up the leaderboard, I say the plan's worth an attempt. If only for reconnaissance. A moat circled the castle's property. Though the water didn't give life to the surrounding trees, its quality caught Dante's eye, rendered oddly. It had a murky fullness to it that reminded him more of oil. He wasn't the only one curious about the water. Ben had wandered over, knelt low, and reached out his hand. What are you- Dante started. Wait, no! Ben patted the water. The water undulated, bubbling and roiling. Leaning against the charred remains of a nearby stump, Tandy yelped when something brushed against her ankle. A sinuous tentacle, thick as a tree vine, lashed around her foot. She fell, screaming as a chorus of profanity rose from Ben and Dante. As he turned toward Ben, another tentacle wrapped around Dante, yanking him away. A much thicker tentacle held Ben aloft. Its breadth and texture gave it the appearance of a long, vain tongue, though slug green and moist. Twin tendrils lashed Dante, dragging him toward the water's edge. The fleshy rope writhed with each flick of her wrist. Dashing toward Ben, Etta drew two blades from her belt and slid on her knees to where the tendril had erupted from the water. She slashed at it. Several thick stalks jutted from the water. A single yellow health bar hovered above them. Minus six HP. Minus three HP. Minus five HP. Minus four HP. The tentacle released Ben and he scrabbled alongside Etta, careful to dodge any of the erupting straw-like antennae. Gathering her wits as she adjusted to seeing the world from her new angle, Tandy grabbed an arrow and plunged it into the meatiest part of the constricting vine. Minus eight HP. Its grip on her slackened enough for her to wiggle free and charge toward Dante. On surer footing, Finn arced several magic missiles, three toward the tentacle attacking Dante and three toward the presumed center mass of the hidden creature in the moat. Minus 15 HP. Minus 12 HP. Minus 18 HP. The dark water boiled. Though part of Tandy expected it to fully ignite, the creature took enough damage to make it retreat temporarily. Up the mountainside, Etta yelled. 
The team scrambled up the slope with Ben bringing up the rear, refusing to turn his eyes away from whatever lived under the water. The groping tentacles spread out like fingers probing the desolate beach and hollow trees all the way to the cliffside edge. The tendrils swished around until the water creature tired of its hunt and withdrew to the stilling murk of the dead moat. Dante faced Ben with near murderous intensity. Who the fuck pats the water? Dante yelled. What was that thing anyway? Tandy asked, hoping to head off the confrontation. No, seriously. I need to know what kind of mind puts together the series of thought of dangerous quest, powerful enemy, and creepy, mysterious terrain to conclude that let's pat the water sounds like a good idea. Enough, Dante. It's over, Edda said. No harm, no foul. Ben locked his gaze on Dante. Dante wasn't appeased. If this is going to work, you're all going to have to do what I say. Ben held his hands up in mock surrender. Come on, let's start our climb. Edda said. Distance-wise, Ravenshire was just over a half-hour's journey from the outskirts of Knight's Holt. After looking at the maps they got from NPCs, the plan was to sneak in a back way to short-circuit the dungeon and steal the crown. But navigating the terrain, rocky slopes, and steep inclines proved much more arduous and added nearly an hour to their trip. Even if they traveled by horse, the animals would have been useless about halfway up the mountainside. Tandy wondered why they didn't wrangle griffins instead, or a pegasus. This route isn't as easy as it looked on paper, Edda said without complaint in her tone. Never is. That's why I wanted to recon the area, Ben said. It's not like we're scaling the whole mountain, Dante said. Look, there's the pass. The mountain veiled a natural earth bridge that ran just over the Skull King's castle. The closer they neared the overlook, the more the reality of a plan hinging on dangling off a cliff hit home. Are you sure about this plan? Edda said. As long as folks stick to it and don't do dumb shit like pat the water for no reason. Dante glared at Ben. I won't lie, though. This won't be easy. The only easy day was yesterday, Ben said with the tone of reciting a favorite saying. I wonder what purpose this ledge even serves. A secret exit strategy. Probably. A lot of medieval castles were built with secret passages and stuff to safeguard against coup attempts, Dante said. But this whole scenario was the poster child for games whose developers don't believe in having it player tested. Maybe the game wasn't ready, Tandy protested. If they didn't think it was ready, we wouldn't be here, Edda said. Speaking of ready... Dante measured each of their faces in turn. Let's do this. Receiving the nod from Dante, Ben gestured, his lips moving as he chanted something too low for them to hear. The area grew eerily still. Tandy glanced around, waiting for something to happen. Just when she opened her mouth to question if he'd done it right, the earth beneath her gave way. Dante stifled a snort. His legs wobbled, unsure of his footing, until he decided to treat the experience as if he were surfing. He steadied himself as best he could, like he was on a mattress of air he didn't quite trust. The air had a squishiness to it, not quite solid, but holding him firm. Once all of them were suspended in the air, Ben carried them over the edge of the bridge and slowly lowered the party. Tandy tested the hold on her by jumping in place. Do you mind not doing that? Ben asked. This does require some concentration, you know. Oops, my bad she said. They passed so close to the side of the cliff, Dante thought about reaching out and touching it. A strange impulse, like he'd never felt rocks before. Part of his mind argued, true, but you've never felt rock on the side of a cliff while floating by. It reminded him of an occasion back when he'd toured a salt mine while in Romania on a game tour. He felt an overwhelming compulsion to lick the side of the wall. When no one was looking, he did. It tasted like salt. Dante's feet were the first to touch down on the ledge. The rest of the group hovered outside the window. Ben nodded and Tandy scrambled inside next. He rotated the invisible air blanket, depositing each member of their party in turn onto the ledge. They huddled in a small alcove. A tunnel branched out before them. Holding up his hand, he signaled for them to wait. Dante took a few steps down one corridor, studied his surroundings, and then doubled back. 
Once he made it down the other branch a bit, he waved for them to follow. Look at this shit. When you're trying to figure out which way to go, it should be obvious, Dante whispered. This layout should be pretty intuitive. The lighting should be purposeful. Dimly lit doors are perfect for finding chests, scrolls, that sort of thing. Well lit pathways should be the way to move forward. It's the universal language of gamers. A good game design. In my world, marking an obvious path signals a trap, Ben said. We ain't in your world. We're in mine. Ben glared at him for a moment. Look at your 12 o'clock. Bright lights, just the way you like them. See? That's exactly what I mean. There's a light source above it to highlight it. If the game is designed right. Dante kept going along his new path. After a couple steps, he examined what seemed to be a large crack and made a disgusted sound. The crevice in the shadows looked too small for anything larger than a cat to enter. He began to search the seams between the bricks. He popped back up. Instead, this dark, poorly lit hole is the way to go. You're complaining because the path is challenging? Tandy lowered herself to examine the crawl space. I'm all for challenging. There's a clear difference between challenging game design, you know? Made to make the player think about things as part of the fun and confusing design. Where if stuff looks cool, throw it against the wall like a toddler vomiting. This one game, I spent nearly an hour backtracking and parkouring my way through it, so I did a little research online. Turns out it wasn't me, it was a game flaw. Dante dropped to all fours and crawled toward the crevice. Impossibly, he squeezed through, the rest of his team close behind. The crevice darkened to the blackest shade of night he had ever experienced. He wasn't even sure he was still crawling forward or moving. Nothing seemed real. Every sound seemed to drop off. His own movements produced only a hint of a scratching sound to mark his passage. A dim glow of gray bobbed in the distance as if the shadows were at least lessening, growing more distinct with every movement. When he popped out, Dante assumed a defensive position. Etta and Tandy followed next. Ben clapped his hand on Tandy's shoulder to steady her. Stack formation behind Dante before we enter the room. Ben lit a torch. Dante and Etta lined up with long, practiced ease, Ben following behind. Tandy seemed unsure about what she was supposed to do. Just stick by me, Etta whispered to her. The alcove opened into a deep, cavernous room. At the far side of the chamber was another room. Tandy could almost make out a thin corridor leading to steps. Presumably at the top of their stairs lay the throne room and the crown. They were so close. They only had to cross the room. Two stone sepulchers blocked their way. Check for traps. Dante kept his voice low. He glanced at the windows on the other side of the room. Twilight shifted into evening. On it, Etta said and nodded to Tandy. Etta took one side of the room. Tandy looked around. Concentration, perception, check for traps. He thought about transmitting across the chat line but stopped himself. He hated that he had to learn to trust her skill as a player even if he had little confidence in her actual abilities. The last thing he wanted was scythes spinning up from the floor or the large vines along the ceiling to get it into their minds to drop down and strangle them, or poison darts to shoot from the wall, or a soft click came when Etta stepped on the granite floor tile. She froze in place. What did you do? Dante asked. As if in reply, a coffin lid scraped in the distance. Skeletal fingers found purchase along the edge, testing their grip before pushing up. A death knight rose with contoured armor which possessed built-in cups for a once large-breasted woman. Patches of rotted flesh ran up along what remained of her arms. Orange light glowed from the deep recesses of the sockets in the blackened skull that served as her face. Another one began its slow scrabble from her coffin. Their ungainly movement, disjointed and awkward, reminded him of drunk sorority girls on a dance floor. Violators! They screeched in unison, their voices like the scrape of metal on stone. Tandy launched an arrow, hitting the nearest death knight in the shoulder, minus five HP. Its green health bar barely budged. When she drew another arrow, the creature lunged toward her. Still unused to combat, she couldn't get it knocked in time. She started swinging her bow like a club, minus three HP, minus one HP. 
The Death Knight's health bar continued to appear nearly full. Fall back behind me, Dante yelled, improvising. As the one best equipped to soak damage, he needed to take point. He managed two steps forward before a half dozen tomb crawlers, creatures that looked like skeletal serpents with hundreds of legs, skittered out of the sepulchers. Etta spun her knobby club to parry a blow from another death knight. A tomb crawler scampered up the wall behind Etta and dropped onto her. In the ensuing blind thrashing, she threw herself on the ground, her full weight landing on the crawler before it could dig into her. Minus 15 HP. Get it off! Get it off! Get it off! Three tomb crawlers leapt at Ben. He launched a panicked fireball, scattering them. But it erupted so close to Dante, he barely managed to avoid the blade at the first death night. Don't fire again, Dante shouted. You only aggroed them. The tomb crawlers rose up, their scritching sounds like angry mules. The bones along their backs seemed to flare. Movement from the antechamber to the room caught Dante's attention. A shadow slowly crept down the far stairwell. We're blown! We're blown! Dante yelled. The music began to swell. We have to get out of here! Something big is coming! Back to the window! Ben ordered. I still have the mana to get us out of here. They scrambled through the crevice opening back toward the window. Ben gestured frantically. Tandy and Etta pressed in close. Dante shielded them as best he could, slicing the tomb crawlers, peeling them off his back as the Death Knights advanced. He knew the Skull King would soon enter the room and it would be game over. Go, go, go! Dante shoved them. They scrabbled to the window and Ben's levitating air pillow. All that filled Dante's mind were the words. Mission. Fail. You're listening to Control Alt Destroy, starring Summer Glau. Produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm. Listen away. Control Alt Destroy is written by Andrea Phillips, Maurice Broadus, Jacqueline Koyanagi, and E.C. Myers. Executive produced by Molly Barton and Julian Yap. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music by Amanda Rose Smith.